Thank you everyone for joining. This is an awesome packed room here. We are super excited with uh, our Marketplace launch. We have a, a great panel of esteemed uh, colleagues that have all, are, are all launch partners uh, with our Marketplace. So today we'll be doing a, a panel discussion on the future of data sharing and collaboration, and really touching on a lot of topics about open sharing, collaboration, Marketplaces, uh, as well as generative AI and what that means. So really excited for the panel today. So what we'll be doing is quick intros from the, from the different panelists. We'll jump into some uh, Q&A with the panelists, as well as open Q&A from the floor. Uh, so have your questions ready, and we'll definitely get to them uh, at the, uh, the latter half of the panel. So without further ado, why don't we start by going around the horn, uh, and each panel doing a quick intro. Uh, my name is Brian Battaglia. I actually work for a company called CoreLogic, in case you're looking behind the screen wondering what the heck is Property Intelligence Solutions. That's actually the business unit I lead within CoreLogic. And uh, if you're not familiar with our company, we're somewhat the heartbeat of the uh, of the property ecosystem. Uh, we deal with about 80% of the real estate agents in the country, 90% of the mortgages touch our data, and we have 10 of the top 10 carriers in insurance, and we do a lot with some of the adjacent industries. So specifically what my business unit does is uh, we are the data and the analytics business of the company, and we distribute as such across all those end markets. Hey everyone, my name is Snake Hacoletti. I'm Vice President of Product Management at ZoomInfo. Uh, if you don't know ZoomInfo, we're focused on business to business intelligence for sales and marketing teams. So we effectively help customers go to market, find their next best customer, and optimize their sales and, and go to market strategies. Uh, on the product management side, I've been with the firm for seven years. I focused really predominantly on, on our integrations and what has been up until more recently, integrations into CRM, MarTech stack. We're really excited about the emergence of you know, data lakes and, the, and, and that technology as it pertains to go-to-market teams. We see that as a huge, huge uh, uh, avenue of growth for us as a business, but really uh, a new echelon in, in going to market um, and, and the level of sophistication there. So very excited to be here. Hey, um, Paul Lentz, I'm from AccuWeather. Um, if you don't know AccuWeather, you should open your phone and download the app right now. <laughs> uh, we have a huge consumer experience that we power with. AccuWeather's been around for 60 years. Um, our data collection process, we've got a, over 100 meteorologists um, who are working with us building forecasts from all the data we aggregate globally. Um, my role in BD is to really take these weather and data assets that we have and distribute them away from our owned and operated properties. And we have a pretty robust data business already, primarily powered by an API uh, and CSV files via FTP, which we were talking about before, um, because we've been around for a long time. Um, we are really excited about the Databricks marketplace because what it's really enabled us to do is deploy and make available um, decades of historical weather data. And that historical weather data, we think, is an incredibly powerful signal that can be applied to innumerable use cases in innumerable categories and verticals. Um, and then can be married, you know, to analyze within Databricks instance, and then look at our forecast data to kind of apply those learnings that you make to plan future business things that you're doing. So we're thrilled to be a part of the marketplace launch and uh, really looking at this to kind of four or five X our data business and make it an incredibly meaningful part of uh, everything that we do at AccuWeather. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Naftali Khan. I'm the Global Head of Partner Cloud Strategy for the London Stock Exchange Group, LSUG. Uh, I lead the go-to-market aspect of working with cloud partners, such as Databricks. My background is in the industry, but coming from technology startups and financial services. Uh, there's a couple of things I hope we leave today with, uh, and that would be three key messages. One, that in financial services, the adoption of cloud is actually finally happening, and it's happening in a meaningful way. Second, that there's a real opportunity to use this uh, migration to cloud uh, in a way to harmonize all these discrete, discrete uh, systems and data sets that today uh, are across most desks in a way that is you know, far from uh, you know, ideal way and efficient. And third, from an LSEG perspective, uh, just want to talk about how we're committed and by joining the marketplace here, we're delivering on our strategy to be a truly uh, multi-cloud distribution strategy. So excited to be here. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. All right, why don't we start the discussion around just topics around innovation around data collaboration and sharing. So maybe we'll start with you, Snay, in terms of as you've seen your customers change delivery and what, what are some of the key capabilities and innovations you've seen in, in data sharing and that you'd like to see in the future in this yeah. area? Yeah, I love that. So I, 
you know, the first thing that happens when we plug into our, our customers, really their data teams, first question is always, what now? And so, you know, we're, we are predominantly selling to the go-to-market teams. The buyers are actually the ones that sit in the sales and marketing organizations. We're actually, we're having to have to work across departments back to the data teams to have to have them obviously make use of and operationalize those data sets. And so one of the things I'm most excited about is really building tooling around our data to help our customers really gain value and that traction very, very quickly. I think that's a differentiation that Delta Sharing's capabilities are bringing to the data sharing ecosystem in a way that we haven't been able to do yet. Um, ultimately, what that means for us is visibility into usage, visibility into you know, quicker time to value, and ultimately retention. Um, so we're coming back into those customers, we're driving value quicker, and we're having more meaningful conversations about growing that. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And, and maybe on the heels of that, you, you mentioned how Delta sharing is more than data. Maybe a question, maybe start with Paul and, and, and uh, Brian, like your opinion on, as we think about sharing these other types of data assets, like apps and models and notebooks, where do you see that impacting your business and, and just collaboration in general? Maybe, Paul, why don't you start and then Brian? Sure. I, I think the notebook concept is massively valuable. I mean, just to something you were just saying as well. Like, if we're able to, as I was describing, you know, when we talk to people about the weather data, there's usually a pretty instant, uh, oh yeah, weather, that makes sense, that impacts me every day, I get it. But to help paint a picture and tell a story for how a business can use this to either improve their bottom line, their sales, traffic into stores, whatever they're trying to accomplish, um, it's not always obvious. And I think the notebooks that we've already put up, I think are incredibly compelling because we're telling a story to the consumers of the data, the actual analysts or the data scientists themselves in their language. Here is how to use our data. Here is a way to deploy it. And it's also just right here for you to grab. So, you know, come in, make yourself at home and see what kind of magic you can make with the data. I, I say I would agree with that wholeheartedly. The, um, you know, our mantra is, uh, you know, be where the customer is or where the customer is going. And to the comment that was made down there, our, all of our customers are going here. Um, they are going to the cloud. And so what we're really trying to do is to put our data in the forefront position. Notebooks are a critical part of that because it just really does allow the customer to do so much more with the data immediately once they get in there. They can start to drive use cases. We can then uh, start to monitor their usage in terms of what they're looking at with the data, collaborate with them, and then we'll continually refresh our notebooks and be able to make it that much more effective. But you hit on apps, and apps, I think, are the ones that kind of really get us excited as we look longer term. Because so much of what we do today, if you think about the different markets we're in, we build specific UIs. And those UIs are kind of They've been built over the course of time around a specific point solution for a specific persona, et cetera. It doesn't make a lot of sense at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so if we can start to kind of deconstruct those apps, or those, those UIs really, and create those as apps inside uh, the clouds or inside the workflow mm -hmm. themselves, it's going to be a far more efficient way for us to go to market. And it's going to be right where the client needs it instead of trying to kind of come out, come into our environment, get whatever information they need, then bounce back. Like it's just clunky when that has to happen. So when you start to build the apps, you start to eliminate... Um, uh, you really start to eliminate friction and you get a much better client experience. The other thing that I think is going to be pretty cool is when we sort of all start building apps on top of each other to the client's benefit as well and start kind of collaborating from that standpoint, which probably still a little bit further away, um, but I do think that day is going to come. Yeah. I, I would just add one more thing. I think uh, in our industry, there's this uh, persona of you know, greedy uh, data consumers People want to get their hands on as much data as they can and they want to save it locally and what ends up happening is incredibly inefficient in the sense that people are storing it, maybe changing it a little bit and then you have multiple copies that are just slightly different that run across the organization. You know, the model we're going towards where you can share notebooks basically turns this on the head. Instead of bringing the data to the query, you're bringing the queries to the data. You can start with a single copy of really good data that you put in one place in the cloud of your choosing, and then you can query it you know, across the org, and when you're done, you know, delete the output. You don't need to save the data again. And you also can uh, create you know, different scripts that allow you to export the data in any format you may need in order to power other technology that may be isn't in the cloud or you know, maybe doesn't really fit the use case over here. So I think what ends up happening is that you can work with far fewer data, uh, far less data, and then also share the same content set instead of buying it multiple times over. There's one stat that I love and I'll share that, and that's only 1% of data that banks buy ever actually gets used. 
So there's a tremendous amount of waste over here that clearly we can improve on. 100% agree, and it's really good points around collaboration. And maybe just kind of piggybacking off that, Nathalie, back to you, is Elseg, what do you guys see as your strategy with marketplaces, and how do you see this kind of capability and platform evolving over the next few years as well? Yeah, so that really picks up on, on that point of a year. You know, there's ways of really, you know, sorry to call it bastardizing cloud, but you could really do it the wrong way. You can lift and shift and try to force your existing workflows and basically force it on something in a way that's far from efficient. You know, by way of example, I, I got a call last week by a firm, a multi-strat firm that has, you know, many pods of uh, traders that basically operate under the same umbrella, but uh, aren't allowed to see each other's data. So rather than put the data in one place and partition it in a way that everyone could work with it, but is blocked off from seeing what the other wants to do, this firm wanted us to put the data 50 times over in each account. So, you know, there's clearly an element of education that has to be uh, accomplished over the time. It has to be done with some of the concepts that are used that are foreign to our industry, things that really keep compliance people up at night, like, you know, public open cloud is something that, you know, is, gives nightmares to compliance departments uh, as far as, you know, being safe to use. So effectively, I think what needs to happen is to, to show that Cloud really can accomplish everything that we want it to do from a compliant perspective, and there's tremendous efficiency that can be derived. Performance can be improved, interoperability of data uh, can also be improved, and cost can be brought down a significant way. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I think if I, if I was going to also kind of echo that, it's just making it easier and more frictionless for the customer and driving time to value faster. And, and you know, on that topic and kind of piggybacking off of what you mentioned, Brian, and maybe I, I want to put this question to Paul, is like this concept of collaboration between vendors and building products. We'd love to hear, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. What are, what are some of your thoughts on how that can evolve and, and what that could look like uh, in the future? Well, I, it starts with the kind of marketplace ecosystem that you guys are putting together. Um, and meeting our customers where where they need the data to be and i think the kind of going back to like our our challenge of educating educating the universe about the weather data and its applicability to people's businesses i think with you know probably with every one of us up here there are ways we can easily come up with to be collaborating with each other for a client for a more powerful solution and um, the fact that we can do it in a sharing environment that you provide just it removes so many layers of headache. I mean, honestly, if any of us were trying to work on a data exchange with a third client uh, without a platform like this, it would never happen. I mean, it's just, it's way too complicated. Uh, but this does give us that capability. And, you know, I think, no pressure. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, the going to the people who are built on Databricks uh, as that customer base that we can serve because we are all in this marketplace. Uh, I think we are also looking to Databricks to help bring some of those people to us. I mean, yeah. I think we will collaborate with each other and we will come up with interesting use cases um, and then kind of figure out ways to bring that to those people who are really, you know, the, the heart and soul of Databricks. Can I just say, what, one piece on that too is there's one angle which is the collaboration from the customer side and the community that they built. Um, customers always want to learn from their competition and they're continuously asking us about how they should be doing X, Y, and Z you know, initiatives and be running motions. And they are always looking left and right to see how their competitors are doing it. And so your ability to actually launch a, a community of sorts where they're actually learning from and building, like to Nathalie, your point, like the, the actual notebooks and the queries themselves become the assets uh, that the community drives and grows. The innovation that can come out of that is really, really exciting. Um, and then the other side of it is obviously for us as, as partners, I mean, the opportunities for us to jointly go to market quicker, you know, technology partnerships effectively powered by these shared assets that we have and then all the tooling that comes out with these, um, you know, shared assets is, is a really interesting new unlocks that we have from a go-to-market perspective on the publisher side. Yeah, that's really cool. And maybe a, a question to you, Sine, is, uh, you know, we, we hear this topic of open sharing, right? What do you think of walled garden sharing ecosystems and, and what's their, where, where do they go in the next few years? Yeah, you know, that one's interesting. So I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Does anyone else have a thought on the, the well, wall garden piece? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. You want to go first? Go ahead. Well, I would say this. The, um, 
We definitely believe in the future where it's going to be open. Um, we really do. Um, I will say that we still have some convincing to do even inside our own organization about that. However, it's inevitable that's going to happen. You know, there will be a democratization of it, if you will, and you know, being open is going to be far more advantageous. I do understand the walled gardens um, in the concept of obviously they have very proprietary data, they have very proprietary information that they're trying to keep as such. But over time, I think you're going to see that that if, if you try to maintain that, I just think the markets themselves are going to naturally connect around the walls. And then you're kind of going to kind of find yourself in a, in a deficit position. And so as we're continuing to build now new things, that is the mantra that we're talking to the team about, is build it in a way that's open. And that's a very interesting shift for us as an organization to do that. So... Um, for, for, for us, I really think we just need to be on the, uh, at, at the front of that. I think if people just try to retrench and say, I'm going to stick inside my four walls, over time you're going to lose. Well, and I think we're, we're willing to meet people inside that walled garden if that's where they need us to be. Uh, but uh, agree, like we, we are looking to the open experience of it. And I kind of the way I've been equating it to people who ask me about it is, you know, Android and iOS both exist. And um, there's a very clear value prop for one way to do every single thing you can do in iOS if you're an iPhone user. A lot of engineers prefer Android phones because <laughs> there's a lot more that you can do with them. They're much more extensible. You can customize them. And I think that it's, it's different because there is a product that has been profoundly impactful and creating a lot of value. Um, in an, in an iPhone, maybe a little differently than Android, but um, they're they're both going to exist, and we're we're going to have to be everywhere. But I do think that unlike at least in the U.S., where there are probably more iPhone users than there are Android users, um, I think the openness is going to have to win out. And those walled gardens are probably going to end up not being truly walled in the way that other uh, environments have been. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So on the topic of marketplaces then and I think this question is just an open one because I think there are probably opinions on a lot of this but you know back to your analogy of like Apple and the app store right a lot of those apps can be monetized directly in the marketplace with commercialization one click and you can buy it what are your guys opinions on these data marketplaces and these marketplaces in the cloud uh, should they have a monetization capability is that something you think is, is value is it advantageous what, what's your perspective maybe Naftali why don't why not I'd love to hear your take on this yeah, sure. So again, along those lines of education, marketplace means a lot of different things to different people. You have software marketplaces, you have marketplaces that are fully transactable, and you have marketplaces that are really just like a data catalog where there's a listing of offerings. I think, you know, talking about the Databricks marketplace and the vision that I think is where that is going, and I'm excited to hear about it, is one that basically is allowing you to put a lot of different type of data in one place and making it really easy to pull this type of data together in order to you know, do the type of things that we can't even draw up today. We talk about like the audience uh, sitting over here today. You know, imagine like AccuWeather data is in the cloud and then you have Alseg's data right beside it and somebody wants to you know, basically start building a model that's gonna look at the you know, change in the weather and, you know, the impact on potential, you know, pricing of commodities. So that's something that, you know, effectively you can accomplish in a marketplace when you make it really easy to work with these different data sets. And look a little further into the future with, like, you know, the large language models and, you know, what they can accomplish and looking at the data when they can start on their own linking data and drawing out the different uh, relationship between content sets. So you don't necessarily have to link on unique identifiers and on its own, it could start, you know, making it really easy to write queries in natural language and come out with like really insightful, you know, outputs from it. I think that's the direction in marketplace that's really exciting where it goes. Of course, existing marketplaces are interesting here and now, and I'll talk about you know, our perspective at Elseg, you know, we have a unique position because we're both buyers and sellers in marketplace. And today, I think a lot of the benefit in the marketplace comes to, you know, potentially using spend that you have to reach in order to reach your commits through the marketplace in order to reach it. So for us, you know, that meant one year we had to, at the end of the year, we'd, we had to cut a big check to a CSP that we had to commit to. The next year we bought, you know, bought a lot and bought it fast through the marketplace and we saved a couple million dollars by doing that. So there's benefits 
here and now today and using these marketplaces. But I think where it can go is a lot more exciting than just the short term benefits. I would just add a little bit to um, agree completely. I do think monetization is why, why we're here. I'll just speak from court logic. <laughs> <laughs> if we can't figure out how to monetize this, then what was the point? Um, we actually have a goal inside the company to be able to do whatever a client needs to do to be able to purchase from us inside three clicks. Now, we're a long way away from that across all of our platforms, but that is aspirational. So when you say one click, I agree with it, but there's a lot of things that are going to have to happen to make that a reality, which is you're going to have to be able to kind of think about your click-through terms from a contracting standpoint with those clients. If those clients are buying multiple data sets from multiple publishers, how does that work? How do we understand really where the data is going? What are the use case restrictions around it? Because it is the IP of the company at the end of the day. And so we want to do that, but I think there's going to have to be more thought and more technology that starts to kind of get implemented that enables that as we go forward. But I, I really think that is sort of the vision that you guys share as well, uh, longer term. Yeah. It's a good answer, and I agree. Monetization. <laughs> this is obviously Data and AI Summit, Generation AI, LLMs, AI. It's on the tip of everyone's tongue here, so I, I have to ask a few questions on this topic. And so maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Sine. What, what What's your thought on how LLMs and generative AI impact data sharing, data collaboration, and, and this, you know, the, the ecosystem here? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll take it from the consumer perspective, and I think Look, data is a means to an end, and that end is answering questions. Um, our customers come to us, they access our data, they utilize that data to answer business questions. Um, and so I think ultimately what we're very excited about with the, with the emergence of LMs and, and generative AI generally is this the ability and reduction of friction in that discovery process, in finding those answers. And so um, you know, I'm tying this back to the time to value from the customer's perspective. Um, the quicker that they can get their insights, derive actions from those, and then impact business from it is really kind of the focus point for us. I think there are some interesting ways that we also can benefit from, from uh, as an organization that actually publishes these data sets. Um, from a you know, data quality perspective, when we think about how our customers are actually utilizing these data sets and, and, and you know, the, the questions and the models that are being derived and generated, there's actually a lot of inference we can learn from those. Um, so I think from our side, we're very excited to see how our customers end up utilizing these and the, and the fact that we can open up our data and expose that in a way where our customers can actually run these models directly on our data sets. Like there's a lot of learning from us. That's interesting. Anyone else? Oh. Yeah, sure. I could share a little bit, uh, you know, about what I see coming over here. So as some may know, Elseg and Microsoft, we, we had a big partnership we announced earlier this year, and Microsoft obviously has a majority ownership in ChatGPT. So we, we talk about some of the applications and use cases and kind of where it's going. And, you know, I think it's an incredibly powerful tool. At the same time, there's a lot of progress that needs to be made. You know, right now I would say, you know, uh, for the for many things, it's, it's just a straight out a liar. And, you know, you're going to ask questions and you're going to get conviction, which totally isn't merited. We got a, uh, okay. some help from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think where I see it going, again, for the type of use cases that we're looking at in financial services, or is the ability to have uh, a, gave, a little window into this powerful tool that can work on the back end. And there's nice integrations that can be done into chat, and you can have a little chat buddy that you add that you can ask questions from, and on the back end it can be looking at you know, your complete model and, and giving you what you need. And it could also be doing it even without you asking for it, just basically looking at potentially your portfolio or a trade you're doing, and it could weigh in on, you know, a better way of, uh, you know, hedging or, you know, other proposed things that can't be done off of the data. But at the same time, you know, there's real problems that we have to solve for. You know, privacy is a major issue, and, you know, there's still the potential that, uh, you know, these models spit out information that they shouldn't. And then, again, if you're the one sponsoring it, you're on the hook for it. And as regulated entities, there's a lot of risk associated with it. So I think it's going to take, you know, some more time till it's really integrated in a meaningful way. But again, for, you know, the no desktop space that it takes in order to have this and the fact that it's really not intimidating to talk to, uh, you know, a chat buddy, then, you know, it's going to be quickly adopted. And again, it's uh, incredibly powerful. I could give an example because in my uh, 
one of my earlier companies I, I worked at, we, we built a, a chat buddy at the time. It was still AOL. Everyone was using. So we had an aim buddy that you can add and you can type this pre-configured syntax in order to turn, you know, that syntax into an electronic order and route it to your broker. So you could write side size symbol price. So you just take buy a hundred K X, Y, Z at $10 and route it to your broker. The place where it got interesting was that once people were using this, you could already configure, you know, a lot more sophisticated type of programs that run off of a specific trigger word. So we once had a trader that came to us and said, you know, sometimes I have 50 orders out to the market, the market might turn on me and I need to cancel all of them. And, I, and we're like, okay, he's like, I want a command to cancel it. It's like, what would you call it if that happened? He's like, I'd call it panic. We're like, perfect. You type panic and all your orders get canceled at, at one time over here, yeah. which was, you know, they were really excited about it. Think about where we are today, where again, it doesn't need to be pre-configured syntax. You can ask the question very naturally the way you would phrase it to talking to a friend mm -hmm. and you're, you know, you're scraping, you know, tremendous amounts of data really, really quickly. And uh, again, you're able to have these pop out of a uh, at chatbots, you're giving up no desktop real estate, which is incredibly expensive in, again, our space. Yeah, that's, that was a great example. Super interesting in terms of the space. You know, one thing that you mentioned was around privacy, right? It's mm -hmm. actually the topic that comes up a lot around collaboration and clean rooms. So maybe, Brian, I'd love your thoughts on, like, what's the future of, of data privacy and, and where do you see clean rooms fit into that? Yeah, all of our clients um, obviously require clean room uh, as we sit here today, and they're all hypersensitive. Privacy issue. Um, what I uh, sounds like there's go backwards. We'll go this way. Okay. Um, they're, they're hypersensitive to privacy. Um, at the end of the day, the. Um, I think when you think about the future of clean rooms, though, there's going to have to be a way that from a privacy perspective that you can have your data in there. Um, it can be in there with another party's data, maybe even two or three or five more other parties all at the same time. There's going to have to be that ability for everyone to be comfortable having their data in there for the, for the length of time that it's actually needed. And, um, and that kind of gets back to a little bit of kind of what I was talking about earlier with some of the chain of custody issues in terms of who has what and how are they thinking about it and what are they doing with it. There's going to need to be some capabilities that I think folks like yourself build into these clean rooms that allow us as the data publisher to really have a high degree of confidence that what is in there from our data and the standpoint of how it's being utilized by anyone else, the other party that might be in there, ultimately is um, something that they can't just take and just remove, right? And that's where we get very, very sensitive internally from a privacy perspective, because right now there's really not a cloud that can guarantee that at the moment, unless you build something that is absolutely completely shelled off. Um, and that isn't advantageous to the client, which is where you end up with that friction point again. So I do think that there's going to have to be a technology of some sort or some sort of a, uh, an operating rig or a process that gets put in place with a lot of these that allows it to maintain privacy, but at the same time still be inside this clean room environment that can be a collaborative space. When some of that starts to get solved, then I think you're going to see the clean rooms proliferate into something much bigger over time. Um, and what I mean by that is we have a, we have a partnership we do. It's actually not in... in in Databricks Cloud, um, but we do it, it's kind of inside our own environment where basically today we have a partner that's refreshing a data set with us on a daily, nightly basis It comes across, we refresh our entire data set, and then we're pushing back out the combined data set to our clients. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily efficient for us. Like we don't necessarily want that. The partner doesn't really even want that, right? So it, it would be better served in a clean room like this through a third party like yourselves to be able to enable that, but neither one of us at this moment in time will do that because of this very issue. Yeah, now that, that's really, uh, insightful. I know we have about 10 minutes left, so I did want to open it to the floor uh, for any questions. Yeah. Um, I know we've talked about how data is value, so where do you draw the line of the data that you're willing to monetize and sell and the data that you want to keep internal and not have others seeing and that you can make your own decisions off of? That's a really good question. Um, I think uh, for a lot of what we do uh, at AccuWeather, because again, we have this huge weather business that we have that's powered from our weather data, um, we, we're careful with the use cases almost more than the specifics of the data in a lot of ways, because we don't want someone to, be, to build, you know, AccuWeather 2.0 and then come out and compete against us. Um, so it's more, uh, it's a lot more focused on use case is uh, I think primarily what we focus on um, 
Because the truth is a lot of the proprietary things that we've built, like real feel and certain things that are very specific indices that we build around certain wellness or healthcare issues, those are very powerful in the marketplace. Again, as long as they're not going to come out and rebuild the same thing or reverse engineer it to compete against us. That's probably uh, a bigger thing for us. And I would say the other kind of line drawing thing for, for us as a consumer facing application and set of properties and things is really um, users. You know, the user information and the user data, not something we're comfortable with uh, leaving our four walls at all. We actually are already planning for that. We think that's the way it's going to have to go. It won't just be data. I mean, we actually sell a lot of analytics. Um, probably, probably all of you do, actually. Um, so it's going to have to be the analytics side, but then it's also going to be um, kind of really that co-ideation that we're talking about that's also going to end up being distributed through the marketplaces as well. So um, we really think about it as the entire product suite we have today outside of cloud at some point should absolutely be able to be distributed through cloud. 100%. I think in the future, that becomes the product. Yeah. Um, you know, in the future, when we're just selling data, it's, I think people are going to look at you twice. And I think there is a very, very clear path towards us being able to think about this product well beyond just rows and columns. And it is actually uh, a solution that's being used to serve a particular use case. And those types of assets make that you know, really come to life for our customers. It's, it's interesting. I feel like the notebooks are kind of like a stepping stone to those also, right? There's like a complete uh, realization of what, how you're trying to show how your data can come alive with apps or models that live on top of it. So it's absolutely the direction to go in. Yeah, I'd say my perspective on this would be, you know, often we see clients doing very similar work, you know, from one firm to the other. And that work isn't necessarily something that has a secret sauce as part of it. It's just a routine task that needs to be done. Those type of things, you know, we want to make off the shelf available to them. We don't see a lot of value in it being run independently and kind of, you know, closing it off between them. We draw the line when we're talking about things that, in theory, you know, put ourselves in competition to, to our clients. So again, if it's a routine thing that people are wasting a lot of time that's inefficient and we can help them and have it be included in their notebooks, then great. It's interesting. It's kind of, I was thinking about, as you were saying that, really what you were saying earlier, Snee, about, you know, customers look to us to tell them what their competitors are doing because we work across them. And this is actually a way to build something really proprietary and interesting that we can bring our knowledge of this common use case to that you may not see it from inside your organization because you're just... You're doing your thing, but we do. And I think that is really going to be an incredible use case for some of these applications that we could deploy and that those do become the product that we're making available much more so than the underlying data. Uh, Carl Brock from uh, Curious on, on this kind of new trend you talked about, the current versus future. How much of this is you taking it to your clients and saying, hey, we have this idea, here's a better way to do it versus them saying, Oh, I've been thinking about this and kind of pushing it back into your business. Got that too, sorry. Um, we started out with the former meaning we were kind of pushing and saying, hey, here's stuff we could do. A lot of this was born, you gotta understand, a lot of, with our data at least, a lot of it was born out of the fact that so many of our clients had no idea what we had. You know, somewhere along the way, there had been a sales rep or, or someone that had sort of explained a use case and sold a data set. Well, the company has hundreds of data sets. And so until you can kind of get clients to understand the depth and breadth of the data, you don't have an opportunity to really efficiently upsell. And so it was born out of kind of the former, which was the push. What is very interesting though, is that as we have gone live in these marketplaces, um, our enterprise clients in particular now are approaching us. And they're like, hey, I understand that you have this. I understand that you're doing that. Help me, help me in that space. Help me inside that cloud environment. So I, for us, it's, it's kind of started one way, but it's now clearly shifting the other. Uh, 
Yeah, I agree. And I can just, sorry, I, I, I can I can attest from, from our perspective, look, our, our products that our customers know us for has been SaaS applications for the better part of, you know, two decades. And so when our customers have been utilizing us, they see us as a sales prospecting tool, a marketing lead generation tool. And so the fact that we have had to do a very similar thing where we're, we're pushing, we're going cross departmentally, we're going to the, you know, the data teams, the, the data scientists, the, the, the revenue operational organizations that are doing larger scale data modeling and, and really trying to better understand their market um, and we've got the data to help serve that use case we've been having to sell that but i think now as these types of tools like databricks are becoming more commonplace in these types of teams they're coming to us and asking and pulling us forward on on those use cases as well too the problem is there i think it's the 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 awareness that there are solutions out there and that there's providers like us that can help them yeah, I'd like to say that it's 100%, you know, the voice of the client. That's certainly what we strive to, but it's always a, a little bit of a back and forth with engineering and, you know, trying to build a fun, shiny product over here. But, uh, yeah, again, you get a lot of insight from talking to customers and you learn what are some of those functions that they really don't want to do and that they currently need to do, and they'd be very happy to basically offload and have you do instead. Often they're they're having very expensive resources solve these type of problems because those are the ones that have the domain knowledge, but they'd be much better suited solving harder problems. There's just no one else doing that. So I, I think you know taking that and collecting that data and trying to relay it and have that as part of you know the roadmap for product development is certainly what we strive to do. But it's uh, clearly uh, you know it's a little tug of war there between technology and sales yeah. no doubt and i think we're looking for the marketplace to kind of help us tell these stories better yeah. but seriously i do think that there is i'm hopeful that there will be some more kind of shared learnings and collaboration opportunities so that some of these use cases can see a little bit more light of the day and just kind of spark more of that which will turn into ideally because we want to all shift to that inbound interest. You, you tell me what you want to do with our data. That's really great. You know your business. I don't. But it is. It's a, you know, we're out there shoveling the data as hard as we can, and we'll see what comes back. But that, I, I really hope that there's a lot more that's part of the marketplace that can surface those, uh, surface that in more ways. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, guys. So this has been enlightening for me just around the, Economics of the clean rooms and you're not having to replicate data across environments and within each company's own data lake. Um, could you speak a little more about that and is there anything in the future that this technology might enable that's not immediately there in the clean room? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I do think that consumption model is going to change. So today, by and large, we sell data and we sell the complete package effectively. You get the full breadth. If you're buying tick data, you get it by venue, by month. You know, what you can accomplish with clean rooms and, you know, more broadly just with cloud consumption is you can have a model of by query. You know, you can have a subset. You can start opening up new models for monetization over here that are not currently available. And you can appeal to a different segment in the market that may be you know, otherwise was restricted because it was too expensive to buy the full set of data, especially when in many cases it's very exploratory early on and trying to figure out if this data is valuable to me. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's interesting in, in that sense. And I, I think that's where when there is a kind of a checkout monetization layer in the marketplaces, that becomes really interesting because it's hard to it's hard to kind of put the resources behind exploratory efforts that people are making with your data. Um, you know, that's maybe thousand dollars or they just wanna, an analyst wants to see if one thing actually works. Um, that can take a lot of, uh, you know, finance time, legal time, drafting contracts. You don't wanna do that for a thousand bucks. But if there is some transactional component where people can just come and like take a bite sized chunk, see what they like or don't like and come back for more, that, that makes a big difference. I 
wholeheartedly agree because that's a historically been a real issue for us is that we have not been able to do what you guys just articulated and it's what our clients have wanted you know unless we build hundreds of apis and that just seems highly inefficient as well the other thing i would comment on is that this changes the model for us like we're you know we are multi-cloud as well um, and we fully believe in that and so utilizing someone like a bobsled which is sort of a relationship we just kind of recently got into where we're sort of building once and populating across that is really cool for us to be able to think that way because now we don't have to think about how am I going to go build this five times, um, so to speak. So how am I going to build it once and push it out? How am I going to put my data in one place and then be able to slice and dice and commoditize in a much different way and let them push it out? Like that is so much more efficient yeah. all the way around. There must be a time. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Well, I think we actually are at time. So I wanted to thank the panel so much for your time and insights here. This was great. <laughs>